You're listening to First Film First, a podcast where filmmakers describe their experiences of making their first feature film. We'll discuss those experiences in the context of their artistic development and their subsequent career opportunities. Join me as we take a deep dive back in time to see how fledgling filmmakers came to their decisions. Welcome to podcast number two with Alvin Kuchler, BSC, who has photographed such amazing projects as uh, One Day in September, The Claim, Morven Caller, The Mother, Once More with Feeling, Divergent, RIPD, Hannah, and with directors Annie Boyle, Sunshine, and Steve Jobs. Um, so welcome to uh, welcome to the podcast, Alvin. Thank you very much. When I first got to know your work, it was through your first short film you made with Lynn Ramsey, uh, Gas Man, and then subsequently the project that I'd like to talk to you about today, which is Ratcatcher. So filmed in, I think, 1998. Can you tell us a little bit about how you came to get to know Lynn Ramsey and how you came to get involved in the in the project? Yeah, I mean, so, so Lynn was one year below me at film school. So, you know, we just came to chat with each other. And she start, Lynn started it off as a cinematographer. But um, I think she was so strongly opinionated that it just filtered more towards, you know, the, the directing side towards the end of it. She, she was just extremely passionate and she definitely was an extraordinary talent. So, so we just got to know each other. And then eventually she asked me to shoot like a short film with her up here in Glasgow. I, I, can't, I can't remember now the order. I think it was... Small Death. Uh, I think Small Death was even like three short films within a short film kind of thing. And then we enjoyed that. And then we did like a year later, whatever, we did it, Gas Man. And it was kind of funny because I spoke with a very heavy, well, I probably still speak with a very heavy German accent. And she had a very heavy Glaswegian accent. So a lot of our interactions were actually more instinctual than that we exactly understood what we said to each other. But um, so then, uh, you know, when the then eventually she got the funding for Redcatcher, and it was interesting because at that time, and I don't know how it is now, you have something called like bond companies who kind of ensure the completion of the film, and these bond companies they 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 never like the idea of a first time director to be paired with a first time production designer, a first time producer, and a first time DP. It's probably their version of hell uh but lynn was you know lynn is kind of amazing because she's only this five and a half foot tall little glaswegian girl uh with a strong backbone and she just said look this is my team take it or leave it and she didn't even open up the negotiations so somehow she managed (laughs) somehow she managed to box us all through so so i mean with me was you know jane morton the production designer we had even like Lucia Succhetti, who uh, was a first-time editor. So we, we all knew each other from, from film school. And at that point in our lives or careers, we, we, we were like only pure artists. Um, we didn't have any crafts experience or we didn't, certainly didn't have any production experience. So we came up here and, you know, we shared apartments with each other uh, I, I, I shared an apartment with Gavin Emerson, the, the producer of Redcatcher, and we didn't have any skill set when it came to the actual physical making of a film set. So I, I, we, made, we made like mistakes. We would all tell each other's stress, you know, or we would tell each other's problem which would occur. And, you know, one of the big lessons I learned from it is like, there's a reason why you keep certain problems away from other people. But... Uh, we also had, I mean, I remember we we built one set, which was like the main set of the the home of the main leading boy. It was actually built as a film set, and it was also meant to serve as weather cover. But whenever we came in the first, I, I remember like in the first week or whatever, immediately there was bad weather, and they didn't want us to call weather cover. And they wanted to force us to shoot outside. So I, I just remember that from the very get-go of the of the of the shooting, uh, we didn't know how to communicate with them, and they. I, I felt you know I remember like looking back a bit. Uh, it felt a bit. Um, I I, th- I think they thought they could mold Lynn, but little did they know that Lynn wasn't that that easy to mold. So she would just have you know a very clear 
you know, she, she would have certainly a very clear vision of what she wanted to achieve. But so, yes, I mean, so there was a lot of, um, to be honest, it's like I couldn't watch Red Catcher for many years without looking at it. And every day there was a different drama, it, it seems to be. There was always like a big drama about something. So you always you always sort of saw the, you know, in the final imagery, you, you kind of felt the memory of the of the shooting experience. That's right. So, it, so the whole thing was when I finished Red Catcher, uh, at that point, I was just glad that, you know, I survived and I didn't got fired. And I, I remember because at that point it was like a chicken and egg thing. You couldn't get a, a, a bonded film uh, without having shot one. And, and but, you know, so it was very hard to break in. The first film was such a the, the, the first film was such a big step. You know, to, to manage to get that done was such a big step that at the end, the only thing I was thinking I was thinking about the film was, oh, my God, thank God I survived, um, you know, the, 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 the end of the film. Yeah, the bonding experience to get the sign off to, you know, to work at that budget level again. I mean, it sounds like an amazing group of allies that you had in the in the in the core creative team. So was everybody in that team from from the NFTS with you? Well, I mean, Gavin Emerson, the producer, wasn't the, uh, you know, I mean, they gave us an AD who none of us knew, but which was approved by the bond company. But yes, yeah, so all the core people were from the NFTS. Even, you know, Tom Townend, you know, he was on, on, with us you know, partly as a stills photographer and then shot like one or two small scenes, second unit. Yeah, so, I mean, it was, it was incredibly uh, stressful that way. I mean, it took me years to be able to see Redcatcher for what it is. So when it suddenly, you know, when it came out and, and I got good reviews and suddenly it opened doors for me, I was completely taken by surprise, you know, like uh, because <laughs> I was emotionally so damaged by it that I, I literally also walked away. I thought, like, if filmmaking is that stressful, I can't. I can't choose that as a career. That was really my takeaway after that. I, th I thought, like, there's no way you can make a career out of being emotionally that attached and that involved and that much drama every day and, and, and make a living out of it. it. It was such a roller coaster from, from experiences. It's so often the case with the first film. I've, I've actually, I've sort of skipped over, I should have explained that to people that are listening, that Ratcatcher is an incredible film. I love it dearly. It's set during a very specific moment in time in 1973 during a refuge strike on a housing estate in, in Glasgow. And it's sort of a, it's a coming of age tale of a young boy called James and the family that he lives with and the group of children that hang out around the canal that threads through the housing estate. It really is, you know, from that description, it kind of makes its home within the world of social realism but actually what you guys managed to achieve is something so poetic that it kind of transcends social realism commentary and falls into some place that is really quite poetic and ethereal how did did yourself and and lynn and the rest of the creative team how did you first start the conversations about that atmospheric approach to this film well I mean, so I mean, first of all, you should say that, I mean, Lynn really, the film is set in a world which was Lynn's world. I mean, she really comes from this very Glasgow um, working class background. So I remember the first time I walked with Lynn to her house, we were just chatting and walking. <clears throat> and I think we were like 100 feet out to her, her mom's home. And she suddenly said, said now we have to run. And I, I just, she started to run. I just ran after her. And when I landed inside the house, you know, said, Lynn, why, why did we have to run? She said, well, we still have a feud with the, neighbor, with the neighbors. You know, I don't, I don't want to get into the details of what, why there was a feud, but there still was a feud going on, which still meant that we had to run the last 100 feet to make it safely into the house. I also remember, like, on one of our scouts, I can't remember if it was in Gathman or in the short film, you know, we got shot at with uh, air rifles and things like that. So, and the other strange thing was that I managed to walk around quite freely because I had a German accent they couldn't place me and they would just be curious rather than wanting to beat me up they would just be more curious about it so uh, to Lynn it was very important that she didn't want it to be drab or downcast I mean she saw the, the beauty in, in in that world so 
I think because we'd done these short films together before, there was a, a lot of trust in each other just to... I would say that a lot of the work I did with Lynn, it wasn't that heavily intellectualized or whatever. It was just more... It, it, was, it was more like an instinctual journey of, you know, two artists, I would say. And... And we just went from scene to scene what the feeling of the scene was rather than, you know, stopping and thinking, oh, but in the scene before we did this and, the, you know, we, we didn't have like, I can't remember that we had like an overarching visual plan for it. I, I think we were just very reactive, you know, to what happened to it. And I think that made it also quite powerful. I mean, one of my favorite scenes in Ratcatcher to this day is a scene where they go into one of the other boys apartment you know i think they're like i think they're like five i don't know 13 to 16 year old boys and they're messing around with this girl and and these boys are the real deal kind of story and the atmosphere we, it's almost like in that sequence we turn to documentarian style in the, in the way that she would give them outlines of what to do but then we would kind of just watch it and follow it and film it. And so this, this edginess of the situation is partly truthful because they just were themselves, you know. And then there are other sequences which are very, um, you know, we see Kenny sitting on a wall and we, you know, it's like at the funeral where, which are very stylized, where we kind of carefully designed it and planned it. So I think it's got this mixture of, you know, very photographic approach with with a very documentary approach. But, I mean, I had a very specific color palette in mind. And I used, funnily enough, I brought it with me. There was something called a sandwich filter. A sandwich filter is basically like a clear filter sliced into half. So you can put a, a put a, like a lighting gel in between two pieces of glass and filter your 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 lighting that way and i remember like before i started shooting i tried so many different color variations i you know i don't know if you remember there's like these lee color gels which they use to correct old arc lights and so i made some brown green combination that's what i remember i i personally and at the time i was really into films like a short story is it called a short story of about killing or the Kozlowski film that Slavomir Idziak shot that yeah. it's got those kind of mossy greens and muted browns and it feels dirty and raw that, that's that's correct I really admired that so uh, I was experimenting a lot with it but and I was shooting on Fuji film stock and I remember like I sh my go-to lens was Cook S4s and I kept testing it and I, I didn't manage to find the combination, then I had to go up to Glasgow and I asked Jeremy Foster, who was my first um, AC, I, I said to him, oh, you know, I've got one more idea, combine these two gels and shoot a test with it. And he did it, and then I saw it somewhere, uh, and I really liked it. And then I remember, but what I did forget to ask is how he compensated for that filter combination. So I remember that the very first day of shooting, I just use that filter combination without considering what that compensation should be for the exposure. So the very first, my very first call, so that's how this whole drama started. So, so then the rushes would be sent back to, I think it was Technicolor in London. And then, you know, back then you would get your call at five o'clock in the morning from the from the lab contact, yeah, it's saying, lab contact. saying your your printer lights are looking like this or looking like that. You know, what do you what do you feel like doing for tomorrow? That kind of thing. Exactly. But in that case, the guy called and said, uh, "I don't know really how to tell you. I I don't really know how to save your rushes. <laughs> so, <laughs> so they look really kind of weird. So that was like I don't know. That must have been probably because of the delay. I was now on day three or something, and I got that call in the morning. And, um, and I mean, my, I never forget that feeling. I mean, my stomach was just in turning upside down. I felt sick to my, I mean, I was literally felt sick and I thought what, you know, I'm going to get fired on day three before my career could even take off. <laughs> that was the thought. And uh, I think we've all had, we've all had that morning wake up at some yeah. point in our, in our lives. Yes. I mean, it was, it was horrific. It was horrific. And I remember 
I felt like I didn't want to tell him because I felt he would. There's nothing I can do right now, and I didn't want to tell Lynn so that it wouldn't, um, you know, that it wouldn't fuck up her brain. And I spoke to Gavin Emerson, the producer, and he said, "Okay, let's get the rushes uh, sent up, and uh, let's organize a cinema screening for this evening, and you and me just sneak in there and, and look at it." And um, and th that's what happened. So then we, we we went there, and I looked at it. And to, to my surprise, I thought, oh, my God, this is so beautiful. This is amazing. And basically what had happened is like, I mean, to, to, to get technically into it, you, you know, I also was a big fan of Philip Russelo when I was at film school. And, you know, people who know film printing is like, so your average printing numbers are 25, right? Like out of 50 or something, isn't it? That's your average. Yeah. And people who liked films to be, the blacks to be solid and crunchy, you know, they would aim maybe like anywhere between printing lights between 29 and 32 or 35 even. And then there were people like uh, Philip Russelo who were constantly, you know, around 24. It's like this is kind of the number where the blacks just just opening up. They're not that solid. They're very painterly in my opinion. But when you're that number, it's like your 24 is great and then 23 starts to fall apart. So there's this line where it's like, okay, it's like now it's painterly and now it's fucked up. Yeah, yeah. Now now the, the blacks have got texture and now they've got mush. Exactly. It's like that, just trying to get that right consistency of, exactly. of uh, kind of lifted color. And so is that kind of almost like um, pull processing the negative kind of thing with that underexposure and then lifting the exposure back up in the blacks, you know, by printing up just a tiny bit. Correct. And, and, and the scene we shot, we had like the scene that was affected by that was uh, shot at a canal where, funnily enough, now I'm living five minutes walking distance from it. It was shot at a canal and it had this, you know, typical, beautiful, heavy clouds hovering over the, in the sky, low in the sky. And, you know, because the filtration was very brownish, greenish, it just had, it just, it was very painterly. And then I told Lynn about it, and she looked at it, and she loved it. But I remember, so I thought, like, oh, my God, you know, I should maintain that because it's so beautiful. But because I felt, you know, like physically so sick, I didn't have quite the balls to pull through with it and maintain it because it's just I, I just had such a severe reaction to it that felt too unhealthy. Yeah, you don't you don't want that phone call every day for no. forty days or whatever the the schedule. That's right. Yeah, that was a kickoff on Red Capture. That sounds that sounds amazing. And so this sandwich filter, can you remember the can you remember the lighting gel that was in front? Did you was it in front of the glass or did you put it behind the lens? It was in front of the glass. It's like a well, what about a six by six inch or four by four inch? It's the same way you would use it, where you would put the ND or. or um. But so that was the other tricky bit about it because it was the moisture or the humidity or the rain in glass was very severe. So one of the issues was that if the slightest amount of moisture would get between the gels and the glass, you would very quickly get like a weird rainbow effect. So it's almost like you had to every time you had to check the hair in the gate and you had to pull out the filter to make sure there wasn't like any moisture between it because that, that wasn't a good effect. So it made the shooting quite, you know, tricky. But maybe where I came up with it, because I had one interesting experience when I was at film school. I, I met this camera student from the Vigik Film School and he told me that the, the film stocks in Russia, they were so variant, there were so much variance that they, they had to batch test every different batch number. And they learned how to compensate by making their own filters. And because I, probably because I, I partly admire the East European cinematography, I think it gave me that idea to actually use filters, stronger filters to give it a stronger look. Uh, you probably wouldn't quite get through grading also you have to remember when i shot red catcher there wasn't any digital grade it was really like a one light uh, you would print it and uh, and that that's it yeah you would just adjust your levels of effectively sort of rgb to color time but there were no you know specific windowing or contrast adjustments that you could make contrast was was burnt into the negative that's right yeah do, do you have you ever spoken to slavomir jack about short film about killing 
the only reason why I say it, I work with him on a, a film called Proof of Life, and his box of filters is the most incredible thing I've ever seen. He has about 150 filters in five different cases. So he has ellipses and, you know, horizontal and vertical. He has all sorts of vignette type of effects. But he also has ND shapes in the shape of a person, of someone's head and shoulders for a close-up. And so when you framed up a shot, he would then go through his filter box and be like, right, we want to use this one. And it would be in the outline of the two figures that were on screen so that he had yeah. the natural built-in sort of vignette around the human being that you can see in, you know, Three Colours Blue or, or, or short film about killing. Yeah, no, I, I, w- I, was, I still, to be honest, I still would love to see that box. Funny enough that you say it now, because on the very last film I did with Kevin McDonald, I didn't know how he did it, or I, I, I seem to remember that I called up, I don't know who I called up, Tiffin or somebody, to ask them, you know, if they could make me filters like that, or and then became cost prohibitive. But anyway, it gave me the idea to use optical flats, and I would use a, a cheap candle, and I would hold the optical flat uh, over the candle, so you kind of get that black ruse of it you know do you call it ruse you know the smoke of the the residue of the smoke yeah the um, yeah. the soot i remember you had to do it in a in a room where there's absolutely no draft and then i was sitting there with my filters and i was fogging the edges and the color is actually really beautiful it's like a very dirty brown somehow a brown gray and if you just hold it long enough, it still becomes transparent. And if you know what's important is you had your f stop to the f stop needs to be wide open, and the lens needs to be long enough. You couldn't do it on a wide angle lens. But uh, funny enough, I just did use that trick again in in the last film I did with Kevin. But also the other, you asked me about if I met Slavoj Idisiak, and I think I did a couple of years later. I think I went to a documentary screening where he filmed in former Yugoslavia and I went up to him and said oh you know like I, how much I liked his work and how much I liked the work on the documentary and he just said in this very uh, Slavic accent it is easy to make dead people look good <laughs> that was it <laughs> so and um, so that was my only experience with Slavim Itziak but um yeah, so that was like a big part of Ratcatcher. It was like this filter kept us busy in the camera department, that's for sure. I'm sure, yeah, I'm sure remaking a six inch filter sort of two or three times, you know, a week or even a day must have kept everybody on their toes. Well, just especially in combination with the weather condition. But uh, I would love to see a actual, an actual print because, um, you know, just to, to remember what it felt like as a print. That, that's I haven't seen a print of Ratcatcher for years. But it, is, it shows an incredible control of the colour palette. I mean, what, what's amazing is you fall into, as a viewer, you fall in, into James's world and you're running along the canal with him and uh, experience all of, all of his experiences alongside him. And then there's this moment in the middle of the film where he gets onto the bus and vanishes into the suburbs yeah. and finds the house with the field. Yeah. And the depth of colour yeah. that comes from the field of wheat um, outside the the housing estate that he's going to visit is such a breath of yeah. excitement and a new freshness yeah. to James. I mean, it's an incredible sequence that, that bookends the midpoint and the end of the film. I think without that level of control over the palette that you were placing at the start of the film, that revelationary moment wouldn't have had the impact that it does as a viewer. Was that predicted in the script? Was there was that moment really planned for in, in pre-production? I, I think that bus ride, we were also partly lucky because you kind of... I, I, I do think in that bus ride, the, the filter also happened to work well. But, you know, also in Scotland, in Glasgow, you sometimes get quite heavy clouds, but somewhere the sun comes through, you know? So I think it's like that, you know, so that the background, the clouds still remain fairly solid and dark uh, but the fields got some you know some sunlight you know and I think that was like also one of these magical moments where it just all falls into place but in terms of the other color palette it's like and I, I, I have said that a couple of times I always got a lot of credit for my work with Lynn but the production designer Jane Morton she is just so excellent and I think what happens, she makes it look so real that nobody, I think people was assume that was found like that. But Jane Morton is an incredible artist. 
you know, it's like she went to, you know, when she built the set, she, she partly demolished window frames and everything from locations to, to get the real textures. And she partly demolished bathrooms to use sections of the bathrooms. And, you know, it's, it's also, I mean, if you look at Gasman and the color palette, and if you look at Ratcatcher at the color palette, I mean, she's incredibly good at, you know, while being true to the reality of locations, she had this fine stroke of a fine artist to kind of put that palette together as well. So I, I would say any any film I've been praised for, for my cinematography, where I also, you know, I, I don't want to diminish my own thing, but uh, there also has been in, in conjunction with an incredibly great production designer. You know? Yeah, absolutely. I, I think you can only do something truly great if costume, production design, and camera comes together, you know. So, so I mean, I would also like to pay some tribute to Jane Morton, who did such a great art department job on this film. So, I mean, just to talk about, like, talked about drama earlier, like, for, for example, like that scene in the field, you know, like, there's a scene where he goes inside the building, and then he looks out of the window, and there's this golden cornfield beyond the, the window. I think we had, to, because of Glass Region Summers, I think we had to go there three times. Before the sun shone on the, on, on the field. Correct, yeah. I think two times we got rained out. But, you know, and then said, like, no, I, I can't shoot it like that. It has to be this. And, and she just stuck it to her guns. And, of course, production wasn't happy about it. But, you know, she just, um, I mean, I feel like in, when you look at the film, you can see why it's such a big moment of, you know, of, of the feeling of being in that, coming from the inner city to this cornfield. So, but that was one of the things. It's like, yes, we, we had three attempts at getting it right. Also, it seems, you know, from a core emotional perspective, from James's story that we're following, it feels like it's a moment in the film where because of his, you know, his adolescence, he's looking around for answers from the rest of his community, from his family, from his dad, as to how to evolve, you know, going forwards, how to grow up. And this is a moment in the film where he takes himself somewhere and he has an adventure on his own, under his own self-power, that he creates this moment of pure joy in the field. And so for me, it cracks open the coming-of-age drama at that exact moment. He suddenly, he suddenly sparks into another gear internally. It's a moment where the visuals of the film tell the story in a way that no amount of dialogue ever Ever would. Yeah, and that's certainly the beauty of Lynn Ramsey that you can do these feelings without any words. I mean, to be honest, it's also, I mean, I learned a lot from, you know, beyond filmmaking, I learned a lot because, you know, look, my, my upbringing is, you know, I'm a very much like white middle class upbringing from Dusseldorf. Do you know what I mean? So, so the, I, I haven't, you know, like when I came here to Glasgow back then, we filmed an area that were really maybe only like two or three parked cars and, and the rest was just empty. And, you know, I, I met a lot of characters. I met like one guy who was in prison for a long time and I, and I said, look, you know, um, I, well, how's it to be like in prison? And do you kind of reflect on whatever your crime? And you, you, you would just say things like, no, because you're so busy showing front and, and, and looking tough that the only time you think about anything is like these eight hours you're actually locked in your cell the, the most of the rest of the time you just you know you put that this hard hard man protective wall around and you could feel that with the kids you know like there were things like i remember like living in london whenever the election time people are crying for be tough on crime and then you're actually in these areas and you kind of realize these kids the reason they don't go home is because they just got they just have maybe an alcoholic parent who beats the crap out of them. And so to be outside during the curfew is still a better option than going home. And then we had this fantastic kid, Kenny, you know, who, I don't know if you remember, he was actually the kid uh, with a rat. Yeah, the, 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 with a kid with the rat and the, the balloon. Correct. And, I mean, lovely, lovely kid, and he had a bad stutter. And But the interesting thing was that um, he gained confidence in himself during the making of the film uh, to a degree that the stutter started to go away. And then you suddenly, which, I, which is kind of amazing, you think that's great, but, but not great for film continuity. So, so you had these other slightly weird moments, do you know what I mean? And yeah. um, so, I mean, I, I, I felt like I learned in general a lot about life and I learned like 
growing up in these poor neighborhoods, what it really means. There's so many, these boys, 14, 15, they, they kind of, there's so many of them who were at that time sniffing glue and, you know, killing their brains that way. You know, it was, you know, it's like, it's, it's like a, a very tough neighborhood and very tough uh, upbringing. And some people become extraordinary because of it, you know, like Lynn. But also a lot of people just fall wayside because it was really clear that the kids could only see beyond their own little neighborhood. You know, they, I think that for them, that quite a few of their relatives maybe were in uh, prisons or whatever became like their normality. Yeah, I think I think you're right. There's a an acceptance of of your predicament, as you said earlier on. There's the scene where the James goes to the flat of one of the other boys, and they're they're basically abusing the female friend from the group that talk to each other on the estate. And there is a sort of sorrowful acceptance of what is going on on from everybody. Yeah, and James subverts that moment by taking his turn as they're being told to um but by laying and holding and forming an emotional connection and i think that's the that is what lynn has done and the rest of you guys have done so beautifully with the film is to is to tell this very very bleak existence but in a way that is sparked with compassion and empathy and humanity um at every at every step uh, I don't think there's a, a shot within the film that simply describes space. Every shot in the film has a human being existing within a space, experiencing a space. So the frame that you're looking at has a very specific view on this world. And outside the frame, there's other stuff going on. But right now, it's irrelevant. But that, that there's also, you know, I, I do think that's, you know, I mean, whatever world you inhabit, right? You, you know, if you inhabit a world for a long time, you just live within it. You don't reflect. You stop reflecting on it. You don't. You, you don't compare it. Um, I think that's where that also partly comes from. I mean, I remember working with Michael Winterbottom and on a film called The Claim, which was you know set against the gold rush in California. I think one thing he he was mostly worried about that you know the, the landscapes are glorious, but he didn't wanted them to appear glorious. He wanted them. He, he didn't wanted them to be you know exotic or anything like that. Yeah, I guess that film is is a journey of sort of humanity versus the wild. Is is that right? And so you kind of, even though the vista is enormous and beautiful, actually you want to always be aware of how arduous life is within within this beautiful place. That, that's right. Yeah, but I, I mean, I think Otto Lynn has got uh, just in you know for her the canal and the these they they they, they well she's aware of it, but she didn't want it to dwell on it. The film starts with somebody, he gets some shoes and he tries to damage them. He hates these shoes, you know, and it's like all these close-ups around the shoes. I mean, I think that's what is, I really got to be honest about it. It's like, we, we never had like intellectual conversations about why we would do wide shots or close shots. I think Lynn was so involved in the characters that never really occurred that way. Uh, apart from, you know, if you inhabit, if you're filming on a street which really was rat infest, and we had to bring in our own rat handler, and you, you know, there's a certain, and, and, and it was set against the dustbin strike, so like Jane was putting rubbish and garbage everywhere. If you shoot in that environment for two weeks, and then you sit, suddenly sit on a bus, you I mean, you as a person perceive it the same way as the character, right? You mean you just suddenly, you're relieved to be out of that world, and you suddenly breathe because she's suddenly in nature so it kind of you you become part of the character right i mean you become part of the you, you feel with the character yeah you're kind of channeling their experience through your your lived experience as well what was the schedule of the film like how many days from a logistical perspective but also did you try to schedule around the young actor so james is obviously the center of, of the whole film did you try to schedule it linearly with his, you know, chronologically with his story? Yeah, the, the funny thing is, like, because it's now, what is it, like 21 years ago, I can't, you know, specifically recall, I can't even remember what the laws were at the time with kids. Or, you know, I, I also believe we, we, we must have shot during school holidays. But, yes, I, first of all, we, we would have tried to shoot as mo much linear as we could. But I'm also sure, because I think the, you know, the, the, the main character is also partly of Lynn's family. 
I'm sh- I, I also do remember we pushed it a couple of times. You know what I mean, like where are, yeah, over the eight hours or, or yeah, or into into that little bit of overtime. You know, like, and I can't remember how it was handled if it was if it was stress or not. Um, but I, I'm pretty sure we didn't stick to eight hours. I'm pretty <laughs> sure about that. Um, uh, so, and I think I think that that was partly because a lot of the kids were somehow related on. You know, you, you, again, you're talking about, you know, I mean, Kenny, the the one kid, the one boy, I think he came in one day with a black eye because, you know, there was some domestic shit going on, you know. You know, these kids came from pretty tough backgrounds, you know what I mean? So, um, so it was a slightly different world, I would say. Yeah, they're already pre-prepared for the, the arduous life of a, of a film set. Yeah, I mean, like if... Like to do one hour overtime, they, they they like to be on our film sets. You know, I think I think it was kind of sweet because I think we were the first time they had a window in a different into a different world. They could see something beyond their own, you know, their own territory or their own in, in, in neighborhood. Yeah, there was a suddenly there were role models present that were completely different to the adults that they were used to interacting with. That's correct. Yeah, I, you know, like I, I can remember the, the, on that street there was one character. He was maybe like five foot tall and four foot white, and you know he always was wearing this mo- motorcycle black leather vest, and he had lots of tattoos and even a SWAT sticker tattoo. And he had like a fresh scar, you know. It was like a glass, glass region. What do you call it? A Glasgow smile. Uh, a Glasgow was, smile. Yeah. He was cut from his mouth to his ear, like a fresh scar. And he was walking around with a pit bull terrier, and he always had hundreds of pigeons flying around him. And I remember, like, he kept asking Tom Townend to take some photos in his apartment. And Tom was at first of all he was a bit reluctant, and eventually. He, some say, okay, I come with you. And then they went to his apartment. And apparently it turned out that you couldn't walk around in his uh, living room because uh, your feet would gl- be glued to pigeon shit and pigeon feathers because he just kept fe- feeding these these pigeons in his room, you know. And they were living, the, the pigeon coop was his apartment. Partly, yeah. So, you know, like, so it, it, it's kind of amazing because you kind of meet these people who are obviously hard and hardcore on one end, but on the other end, you know, obviously the guy loved animals, do you know what I mean? So, so, so there's also like a sweet side to this character, you know? Yeah, yeah the, the sort of the inspiration for Kenny. Yeah, I don't know if it was, I mean, you, you know, I would love to know what has become of Kenny, you know, I would love to know what has become of a lot of these characters. It would be interesting to know. Yeah, so it's, I don't know, you just meet a lot of, and I think these, these interactions with these real characters does affect it always has an effect on your work as well, right? Like, yeah, I think it's it's impossible to to separate that lived experience from the work that you're doing at the time. It has a great influence on you know the emotional you know capacity of the of the crew. And I think that's an important point. You know, like I think your emotional response to something is really important. And I think a lot of the great films have that. I mean, like I heard these stories about taxi drivers. You know that a lot of the crew they were on speed and whatever they did, and so in in a strange way, the world in front of the camera is slightly mirrored in the world behind the camera. You know, I think a lot of films which are very raw and effective do that, and I also think you work with Danny Boyle, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, I always feel like Danny tries to create that. You know, whatever happens in front of the camera, I always feel like Danny tries to mirror that on the other side of the camera, which which is a style I like very much. You know, so I I mean, I remember when I did Steve Jobs with him. You know, you, know, you, you work with Danny. He has got this incredible energy, and you know, it's like on the other side of the camera. You know, so in front of the camera it was you know everybody. All the other actors had to keep up with Steve Jobs, and behind the camera it was everybody had to keep up with Danny Boyle. Yeah, that's that is the yeah the usual modus operandi is can you keep up with him when he's moving to the next thought and the next place and the yeah. next idea? Yeah, I mean when we made yesterday, I think globally across the whole film crew, that film is thought of as one of the most pleasurable film experiences of their life because every day was a joy to turn up to set and photograph these 
these people in the great sunshine in Suffolk in the middle of the best summer that we've had for a few years. And so, yeah, so that vibe, you know, bounces off into the film itself, you know, which is perfect. So you you filmed Ratcatcher, you survived the experience, the Bond company didn't come in and, and drag you out by your coattails. And and then what? Then what happens? Were you what was what were you doing between between Ratcatcher and, and, and Morven Keller? Yeah, I mean, so uh, you know, after Ratcatcher, before Ratcatcher came out, I, I you know I had so many interviews for I don't know for BBC TV or whatever, and the door never opened, and then suddenly Ratcatcher came out, and obviously it connected with people to some degree, which took me by surprise, and I think then I. They asked me to do a ten-part TV series called In a Land of Plenty. Funny enough, it was written by another. Uh, the book was written by another NFTS film school student, and it was like a multi-generational story of you know a, a family living up in in Newcastle area, and that was so. I did Red Catch, and then I remember doing that, and I, in a way, that was a great experience because. It, it, that was kind of great because I, I was shooting for so long every day. It did help me to, you know, mix what I learned on Redcatcher with some craft of shooting things also fast and and furious. I mean, it, overall, it was it was a difficult experience but an enjoyable experience. Yeah, and being I guess there, there's a there's benefits to the sort of being thrust into the machine of the industry. And you're like, suddenly there is a particularly difficult schedule where the director can't exert any power over the production side of things and can't say, we need to come back here when it's sunny, we need to make a plan, you know, blah, blah, blah. You just have to deal with the schedule and deliver the schedule with a certain period of time. Yeah, that's right, yeah. I mean, I don't know how you see it. I mean, because I think it's kind of interesting because it's maybe every DP defines their job differently. I mean, to me, you know, to me, what we do is like a mixture of um, art and craft. I don't know how you see it, but um, so I mean, certainly when I was doing Ratcatcher, it was mostly art. But I also I took away from it that you can't do it as hundred percent art because it's going to kill you. So, so eventually you need to replace, you know, or you need not replace, but I think you need to have the mechanics of craft. So when there are really difficult situations, you kind of can cope and deal with them with the me- mechanics of craft. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. There's, you know, like there's an amount of logistics involved in the role with the, you know, liaising with the first AD and with production team in terms of equipment and personnel and time and all that sort of stuff. And and you kind of have to, I find you have to com- compartmentalize yourself so that you can focus on the requirements from a from a direction perspective and and then and then in in the back of your mind open up a compartment and be like right how do we deliver that in the Mm. three hours that we've got that we've been allotted or do we need to campaign for more time or campaign for you know more resources or you know all that sort of stuff so yeah it is kind of a Jekyll and Hyde scenario that you're constantly sort of juggling these two sides of your life because you know you'd love to be able to produce no end of you know equipment and no end of time to deal with something but there's you're caught between the rock and the hard place but also it was some resentment on my part like you know when you get awards and they call the technical awards you know and i you know i never want to be too pretentious about it but you know kind of looking back now i, I, I hate to be this called is a is it you know it's technical what i do because it isn't you know and you know, looking back now, I, I think the way I would define myself is, is definitely. I, I, if I would be just a technician, there are much better technicians than me. I, I think, I think the work of my favorite other cinematographers is also where you just can feel like a personal response to material. You know, I feel like there are some cinematographers out there. They're, they're incredibly good technicians, and the lighting is always beautiful. But it doesn't seem the lighting doesn't seem to change from film to film. It's like it doesn't matter what material they have in front of them, the lighting remains the same. So yeah, there's a craft technique there. There's a craft technique, and I, I think all the great cinematographers do emotionally respond to material as well. And it's hard to pinpoint, you know, how they make their decisions process. You know? What was your earliest desire to go into 
filmmaking. Ah, well, so I read a book, I was 15 years old, I read a book called Scorsese on Scorsese by Faber and Faber and um, described the making of pretty much every one of his films that skipped over a few, but pretty much from, from Mean Streets through to, um, I was reading it in like 1990 or not, no, 1989. And so, uh, so Goodfellas wasn't included, but it pretty much spoke about every every film, After Hours, King of Comedy, Taxi Driver, Mean Streets, Alice Doesn't Live Here Anymore. And um, and when I was reading through reading through the book, and there was reference to Michael Bauhaus and Michael Chapman, and yeah. that was when I suddenly realised that the list of credits on a movie, yeah. um, those people have a real creative impact on the work that they're doing. And yeah. and so it was when I was fifteen that I that I thought about what it would be to be a cinematographer, like how what is the skill set required, what is the tool set? Because up until that point I toyed with, you know, writing short films and writing ideas and yeah. and um and um and that's when I started to feel that there was a, a another place for me. So so you were a very avid book reader as well then or? Uh, yeah, books and books and movies. I was just a, a just a, a kind of a consumer of you know a classic teenage boy in his bedroom doing homework, watching you know VHS of Mean Streets and Taxi Driver <laughs> and Alien and yeah. and um, yeah. and yeah, just um, and then a, a, and then became I guess a cinephile. That's interesting. Um, That's interesting because you know like. I, you know, when I was younger, I had some form of dyslexia. So, I, you know, like, you know, I, I always came from the background of, you know, I, I had a mixed relationship with words, but I always had a great relationship with um, anything to do with uh, images, you know, paintings, caricatures, uh, comics played a big part. And, you know, I, I like you, I don't know if be, in my generation, it wasn't that, you know, like, you either had to go to the cinema to see something or there wasn't anything like VHS. Or there wasn't any kind of uh, rental facility you could, you know, get to see specific films. Yeah, it was very hard to see anything that was not new. So if it was new, it was in the cinema and that was okay because you could attend the cinema. But if you wanted to see... So I remember like a great revelation in my life was when Mean Streets was re-released when I was about 17 and yeah. I could go to the cinema to see it because at that point it wasn't available on VHS. So I had this, I guess from reading Scorsese on Scorsese a couple of years before, I had this imaginary version of this film in my head um, right. that, I'd, that I'd read about. I'd read about the making of this, right. this movie. And then it was, yeah, it was a real, for me, it was a real epiphany to see it up on the big screen. I mean, yeah, I would say Taxi Driver was also one of the, you know, pieces which just blew me away. And, um, you know, and then, I, you know, eventually you learned, oh, my God, they, the soundtrack is played backwards. Oh, my God, that's genius. And, yeah. I, I, you know, I think Michael Chapman was... Was it Michael Chapman? A taxi Driver was Michael Chapman, yeah. Yeah, I mean, he was so good. But also, I remember as a 16-year-old guy, I think it was, for me, it was a revelation. I saw uh, Stranger Than Paradise by Jim Jarmusch. It was, like, kind of the first indie film I saw. And... And I loved it, you know, this group, you know, because, you know, I came from photography and this idea of pushing grainy black and white and making a film about your friends and it was entertaining. That was a real revelation to me that you could make a film about just atmosphere and some, a bunch of interesting characters. It's just, I think it was like the first proper small budget indie film I was really aware of. And I, I, I remember really liking it and, um, so probably I was older than 16. But, um, Did it also feel like it opened a door for you in terms of it was a thing you could see within the context of the filmmakers that you you could eventually become one of them? I, I, you know, I, I don't know. You know like, I think I really just absorbed and enjoyed it. It wasn't like, oh, I'm going to become a filmmaker. That happened to me more accidental. Uh, you know, like I, I had a friend who studied at the film school in Munich. And so that was already, at that point, I was, I don't know, 21, 22 or something. And he asked me if I would shoot his directing exercises. He became a producer later, but he asked me to shoot his directing exercises. And he came to from Munich to Dusseldorf with this old RE2C, you know, like you remember these 
cameras which yeah. were developed in the Second World War, where you had like three revolving lenses. And he just asked me if I would shoot his exercises, and I used my Nikon FM because I didn't have, know about light meters even. I didn't even know about light meters, and I used my Nikon FM to take readings of people's faces, and this matched it, and I matched it to to the camera, and. And then he asked me to do all these setups. And because I came from photography, so I was fuffing around with one setup for such a long time. I remember like when I was shooting, it, I thought, oh, my God, you have to do so many setups and you have to be so fast. And then the real step was that later on he showed me, I think we shot for three days or something. And then he showed me, eventually he showed me um, a, a cut version with sound and everything. And that was... I think what blew me away, you know, like I think because I was part of it, you know, and I think I did enjoy the teamwork aspect of it. And then just to be part of it and see the power of editing and sound was, I think, which just really triggered something in me, you know. And then I shot two more exercises of, of, of his. And then I was for a while, I was kind of caught between filmmaking and, and photography. I still liked still photography. And I found it really weird that I remember being aware as a, as a cameraman, you weren't in control necessarily of the final grade or you wouldn't even own the negative. Do you know what I mean? Like as a still photographer, I owned all my um, own negatives and I could frame it the way I wanted to. So I, I remember I was torn a bit because of the artistic control, but I don't know. Then I, I, then I worked for a while in a, commercial production house in Munich as a, as a runner in the camera department. Uh, I learned a bit more. And then at the same time, I started to apply the National Film School. And then, I don't know, and I, I came into the National Film School and, um, and I, I had a really great time there. You know, I, I met a lot of other great um, people there. And it was kind of like, I, that was, I really enjoyed the feeling because I remember I suddenly was surrounded with all these people who I thought like, oh my God, they're so talented. And I really had to up my game in a, in a good way, it really pushed me, you know, like, you know, like when, when you come from a small place, like Düsseldorf, I mean, I, I was always, in my class, I was the best at drawing and art and all that kind of stuff. And suddenly you're surrounded with all these other people who are really good at something. And it really uh, opened up a lot of uh, avenues. I mean, I remember we had a, a female student from Mongolia. She used to be an actress, and now she was there as a director. And the way she used editing and sound was so different to uh, culturally how, how we perceive things. So it really made me aware of thinking about, you know, how, how color palettes are rooted in the way maybe areas you grew up. And also like about, you know, like depending if you grew up in a big city or a small city or a village or rural, it really affects your perception of the pacing of, of how you tell stories, you know. So I had a really good um it was a really good experience for me personally to uh, be at film school because also at that time I already had like a, a really structured photo apprenticeship behind me. So I had this very structured world for three years and suddenly I had this very kind of studenty, meeting great people, exchanging ideas kind of world, which was perfect for me. So you'd kind of, you'd done your craft learning, as it were, like the negative held no fear for you. You know, you, you knew how to expose and you knew what the, the tool set was. And then you were immersed in this group of fellow students that were all, I guess, enthused to be there and in bouncing ideas off of each other. And were you forced into making lots of projects in a short time period? How, how many projects do you think you made? I couldn't, you know, like, I mean, I, you know, I met my wife there. So, you know, like we did this film called uh, Welcome to the Terror Dome. And my wife was always very strategical. So, so, so every exercise she did was an extension of what we later finished as her first feature film. So, you know, I probably shot three different chunks of, of that. I probably shot, I definitely shot two short films with Lynn. And then, you know, at that time we had exercises on... Uh, umatic cameras we had like so I, I couldn't say I, I honestly can't remember how many short films I, I did I, I remember I went between some umatic stuff a lot on 16 mil and I remember shooting very little exercises on 35 mil I remember that the wall came down uh, after the second year and I was super excited to get all the film stock from the east in black and white, which was 
which I always wanted to shoot an entire film of, but it came, became disallowed because the reason it was so fantastic film stock was because the silver content is so high, so you get these incredible blacks. But it was, you know, of, of course, it was environmentally um, forbidden to use, <laughs> to keep making this film stock. I shot like two little exercises with it, you know what I mean? Like I shot like um, two different things with it and, and it was, it just blew Kodak out of the water. But it was, it blew Kodak out of the water because, you know, it probably had triple the amount of silver in it than Kodak had. Um, and so, and in terms of, um, I used to be a huge fan of Fuji as well. Um, I think there was a, there was a little collective of us during the, the late nineties and noughties who were, who were avid. Um, can you remember what stock you were using or was it anything in particular or were you just jumping around for rat catcher? Well, I, I always remember independent of Kodak or Fuji, I always preferred the 500 stock. You know, I never was a big fan of the 50 daylight version. I always felt it was more crushed. You know what I mean? And, uh-huh. um, I, remember, I used 200 at 500, you know, I can't, I, I mean, honestly, I can't remember the numbers, but I remember that I rather would use 85 filters with ND combined. Yeah. Uh, I felt that... And stay and stay in the world of tungsten for yeah, your film stock. Yeah. I felt that it suited me better. I hardly ever used in Kodak or Fuji 50 daylight. I always felt it was too, um, too crunchy for me, you know? Yeah, too contrasty. Yeah, I mean, my, yeah, my first film was shot all on the 500T, purely from a sort of combination of budgetary and complexity issues, where it was, this is the one thing that I can do simply, keep the grain structure the same for the whole movie, and, yeah. um, and don't yeah. jump around the grain structure. I knew yeah. that it was going to look muddy at times because of the underexposure of some night exterior work. Yeah, but I think that's one of the facets of the decision making that led to an interesting texture for the film. Yeah, I would agree. I mean, I mean it's kind of funny because I do, you know, Andre Sikula, you know, who then went on to shoot the early Tarantino movies. He was also at the film school. He was I th- one or two years ahead of me, and uh, I did actually like his work. You know, I did like um, the Reservoir Dogs and and P- Pulp Fiction. I do. I, I thought he was very unique, you know, um, and I did like it. But he, I don't know if you ever done it. I have tried sometimes. Like I can admire somebody else's work, and then even if I try to copy it, when the moment I do it, it just feels wrong to me. Yeah, yeah. It's like putting on a putting on somebody else's shoes. It's yeah. like doesn't this doesn't. Yeah. I can stand in them, but don't ask me to you know walk ten miles. It's going to go badly. Yeah, exactly. So that's that's how you know. I remember like watching watching that film for Andrew Sikula. I think oh, that's really bold. That's really interesting. I mean, it sounds like you had a great artistic experience and a great craft epiphany while you were there. Do you think you found your voice while you were there, or is that something that you've discovered since graduation? You know, I I remember like again. I think the, the Mongolian students said it to me. It's like you know, you you don't have to rush to find your people. You know, you, you you will find eventually. You will find each other, and I think there's some real truth to it. And, you know, I, I remember there were some students who really tried to be, you know, strategical about their choices, who they would work with. You know, they, and I felt they were really trying to, you know, being logical about their strategical decision making about how who to pair up and who will be successful after film school. I think that's a bad idea, personally. I think. Um, I, I think you just have to learn to follow your heart and, and, and follow the people you just like to exchange ideas with. You know? I mean, to be connecting myself to Lynn, that was any, it, it, it wasn't strategic because you know she was there as a, as a cinematography student who started to direct something. It's just like we enjoyed working with each other. And I remember, like, remember we were shooting Gasman and, and we sent rushes back and the, the tutor said, yeah, that's good, but it never was, ever is going to cut together. And we just decided, because also at that time you're always trying to, you know, it's like fighting your parents or something like that. So we just completely ignored it and we just shot like how we felt it should be shot and how we felt, how what felt right to us. And then that became, you know, that film, that short film got into canon, won quite a few awards. So I don't know, it's like I think you have to learn... I think to be strategical about it is a bad idea. I think you just have to follow your heart in terms of 
what people are interesting to you and what people, you know, do you have a spark with? I mean, I think that's a, a phenomenal lesson to sum up the filmmaking experience, you know, to follow your heart and to collaborate with people that want to tell stories that chime with stories that you want to tell that have a similar way of looking at the world and of wanting to bring parts of the world to life. So it was very refreshing for me to work with Kevin McDonald again, you know, on a very personal project and doing the A camera. I really enjoyed it. I really enjoyed, you know, responding to actors' performances and, you know, the, the intuitiveness I really enjoyed. I think I would completely agree. I think that's the reason why I try to operate is to hold on to that feeling of having your hands on the clay. Yeah. But I mean, that's the funny thing what you say about Danny, because it's true. It's like, I mean, Danny, I think, I don't know when he said it, like years and years ago, he said, well, you know, with you DPs, when, when you stop operating and uh, yourself, you just become lazy and arrogant. He said to me. <laughs> <laughs> that, sounds, that sounds exactly like something that Danny Boyle could say. Yeah. So, so I know that he has got a really kind of specific view of what a DP should do, you know. But that was also interesting because he himself could see on Steve Jobs that I couldn't do that because I can't do a steady cam. Do you know what I mean? So it kind of was interesting that way. Yeah, yeah. and also trying to coordinate that level of lighting complexity whilst also trying to coordinate that level of camera movement complexity is virtually impossible to do, you know, in the mind of one person. Yeah, that's right. I remember the question that I forgot earlier on that I meant to ask was, if you were to go back in time and shoot Ratcatcher again and you were given far more money than you were given before and, and would you do anything differently, um, how do you think you would approach the experience? I, I mean, I, the things, I wouldn't do anything, I, I wouldn't do filming-wise anything different because obviously that was, you know, satisfying and you know like i'm kind of also proud of what we did uh, the, i just would do you know like i think the things which were exhausting to me at that time were things which i felt i couldn't control which was all to do with you know production and having no production experience you know and having no experience of what really the politics are and i find that actually quite amazing like you know like you can go to these film schools but you don't really learn anything useful about the the structure and the politics of filmmaking. So when you're thrust into this world of suddenly being on set, that is actually the one thing which can cost you a lot of energy if you don't know how to handle it. It's, it's like, I wouldn't, uh, well, probably the other thing I would do differently is like, I, you know, as I said really early on, I wouldn't, we as, we were such a, really great cool tight team but i wouldn't tell uh, the production designer all my problem the production designer wouldn't tell me all their problems and you know i think it would be more disciplined about um you know what you know my problem is my problem and i have to solve it somehow um and so i i think it would be more like the framework which i would do differently you know but i wouldn't um it's hard to say, like, what, you know, like, I, I've never thought about what, if I would do anything technically different, you know? Well, I don't think you should. For me, Ratcatcher is an absolute masterpiece. Um, watching it again a couple of days ago has reignited my love for that project and my love for your work and Lynn Ramsey's work. And I'm just thankful that you guys were able to share it with us. Thank you. Out of interest, what, what do you see it on DVD or what, what do you see? Uh, this time I saw it on an Apple iTunes download. So there's a an HD version of it available. Oh, wow. So yeah, it was beautiful. It was like it was it held all of the grain and all of the texture and all of the muted colors. Yeah, it's a really, really beautiful film. One that I think exists in a world on film that would struggle to be emulated in the world of digital capture. I feel the same thing about when I see some work of Harris Salvides. You know, I saw like American Gangster. Uh, he did with Ridley Scott. Yeah, with the bleach bypass process. I, I thought it was incredible. You know, and I haven't seen anything that of that quality for a long time in digital. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. And his, you know, and the work of birth, 
that so super super low contrast captivating in its austerity um i think that's a, a beautiful work of his um and he's a tragic loss it was um so alvin kuchler bsc thank you so so much for agreeing to join me to have this conversation i should have told you earlier on to pause the podcast before we even began so that you could go and watch Ratcatcher and then come and listen to alvin talk about his experience of that and the future thank you so much for sharing your time today alvin well, thank you. It was fun to exchange some stuff, so that's always good. Thank you, Christopher. So, please like or subscribe or any other thing you like to do with the podcast. But most importantly, join me next time for podcast number three with cinematographer Barry Aykroyd as we talk about answering the phone to Ken Loach. Thanks again.